How are you? Good. Good. Okay. Nice to see you. Good. Okay. So uh, thanks for the for the setup, everybody. Thank you. I think Dove had to set up twice with the Chumashim first in the tenth and here. So a double thank you, Dove. And uh, we're on Parshas Lech Lecha. Sorry. Very intent. Okay. Good. Oh, he had a good intent. He had a good intent. Okay. Okay. Good morning, Leah. How are you? Good. Hi. Good. Okay. So we're on page fifty-four, and this parsha is such a strange beginning. Okay. Vayomer Hashem, Mary. Would you like to lead off for us, Bivrit? Ravakasha. Beautiful, beautiful, <coughs> excellent. Marta, in English, please. Hashem said to Adam, Go for yourself from your land, from your relatives, and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you, I will curse. And the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. Great. So all of a sudden we see God speaking to Avraham and making these promises to him. You become a great nation, bless you, your name will be great, you'll be a blessing, I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. So all of a sudden we're starting this parsha with God. We're starting this parsha with God telling Avraham, you're going to become the number one man in the world. Right? Basically. And that is what has happened. Right? If we're going to find one person that most of the people, well, how to best word this, the person who has the most people who identify themselves with him, that's going to, right? Today in the world, right? We take a poll. Which person is it? that has the most people who identify themselves with, it's going to be Avram. Right? You have Abraham, you have Avraham, you have Ibrahim. Right? All three of the monotheistic religions all identify with Avraham. Now, the Muslims will identify also with Muhammad and the Christians with their guy. Right? And we certainly, certainly would have Moshe on the top of our list. But the common denominator, that, and you have the, you know, Buddhists, and you have all those others, but the common denominator is Avraham. So you read this, the first question you have is, wow, I must have missed something. I must have missed something. And last week we didn't do the very last Yutsukim of Noah. Because Avram must have done something amazing for him to have become the one. Right? We agree? You read this, you say, wow, <laughs> what did I miss? What happened? What did I miss that God is speaking to this guy, Avram, telling him he become a great nation, you'll be blessed, right? On and on and on. So we look back and we don't get an answer. Right? We look back and go back to page 50 or 51. And this is where, where, where Avram enters, enters the scene. And it seems very, very strange. Want to take us from, from verse 27? Now these are the chronicles of Terah. Terah begot Avram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begot Lot. Okay, so here's our introduction to Avram. Okay, so let's hear what amazing things about him led to God telling him to be the number one man. Continue. Haran died in the lifetime of Terah, his father, in his native land in Ur-Kasdim. 
And Abram and Nahor took themselves wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milka, the daughter of Saran, the father of Milka and the father of Iska. And Sarai was barren, she had no child. Continue. Terah took his son Abram and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of Abram, his son, and they departed with them from ur Kasdim to go to the land of Canaan. They arrived at Haran and they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years. Terah died in Haran. And then we say, and Hashem said to Abraham, go for yourself, etc., and you become a great, great person. What's going on over here? What is going on over here? What did Avram do? Right? It, it, it almost doesn't make sense when we're reading this. Right? You see Avram tell, uh, God telling Avram, and you know, I think we become somewhat, somewhat Im- uh, immune. Right? We don't, we, we, uh, certain things we just, oh, God told Avram, lech lecha, great, you know, right? We're so used to the story of, right? But, but it seems so strange. Now, the Medrash, the Medrash is filled with what, got, with what led to this point. I'm reading now from the Rambam. During the times of Enosh, this is the Rambam in his laws of Avodah Zarah, of idolatry. And he gives a world history, a, a spiritual world history here. During the time of Enosh, Enosh was the grandson of Adam. Mankind made a great mistake and the wise men of that generation gave thoughtless counsel. Enosh himself was one of those who erred. Their mistake was as follows. They said, God created stars and spheres with which to control the world. He placed them on high, treated them with honor, making them servants who administered before him. Accordingly, it is fitting to praise and glorify them and to treat with them with honor. If these are the, the, the messengers or, or the means through which God controls the world, these are God's creations that he placed in a position of power or of influence, so we should treat them with honor. They thought this would be the will of God, that they magnify and honor those whom he magnified and honored. Just as a king desires that the servants who stand before him be honored, indeed doing so is an expression of honor to the king. Makes sense, yes. right? right? You give honor to someone's child. You hear this is so-and-so's child. Oh, wow, this is the child of so-and-so. Through that you give honor to a parent. Through the servant you give honor to the king. After the conceiving this notion, they began to construct temples to the stars and offer sacrifices to them. They would praise and glorify them with words and prostrate themselves before them because by doing so they would, according to their false conception, be fulfilling the will of God. This was the essence of the worship of false gods. This was the rationale of those who worshiped them. They would not say that there is no God except for this star, right? So it makes sense. We understand how idolatry began. Right? It was worshipping these powers of God. Their message was conveyed by Jeremiah, who declared, Who will not fear you, king of the nations? For to you it is fitting. Among all the wise men of the nation, all the kingdoms, there is none like you. They have one foolish and senseless notion. They, are, they conceive the empty teachings as wood, meaning they know you alone as God. Their error consists of conceiving of this emptiness as your will. Okay, so it started off making sense. After many years passed, those, there arose people, false prophets, who told the nation that God has commanded them to say, serve this star, sacrifice, offer libations, build a temple, make an image, right, so that everyone could bow down to it. He would inform them of a form they had conceived, tell them that this is the image of the particular star, right? This represents that star. How did they know that? They claimed to have had a prophecy. So they all started to make images in temples, under trees, mountains, hills. People would gather, bow down, and they would say, this, is, this image is a source of benefit or harm. You should serve it. You should fear it. Right? Other people dis- d- d- arose and declared that a specific star had spoken to them and commanded them, serve me in this manner. Do this. Don't do that. And thus it spread throughout the world. People would serve images with strange practices. One more distorted than the other. Offer sacrifices. As the years passed, God's glorious and awesome name was forgotten by the entire population. It was no longer part of their speech or thought. They no longer knew him. 
Thus, all common people would only know the image of wood or stone and the temples that they had built. The wise men among them would think there is no God other than the stars and spheres for whose sake they had made these images. The eternal rock was not recognized or known by anyone in the world, except for a few, Chanoch, Metushelach, Noach, Shem, and Aver. This continued until the pillar of the world, the patriarch Abraham, was born. He began to explore and think at a very young age. As a child, he began to think through the day and night, wondering how is it possible for the spirit to continue to revolve without having anyone controlling it? Who causes it to revolve? Truly does not cause itself to revolve. He had no teacher, there's no one to inform him. He was mired in or caused them among the foolish idolaters. His mother, father, people were idol worshippers. He worshipped with them, but his heart was exploring and gaining understanding. Ultimately, he appreciated the way of truth, understood the way of righteousness through his accurate comprehension. He realized there was one God who controlled the sphere. He created everything. There was no other God among all the entities. He knew the entire world was making a mistake. What caused him to err was the service of the stars and images, which made them lose awareness of the truth. He was 40 years old when he became fully aware of his creator. He began to formulate replies to the inhabitants of Orkazim to debate them. He broke their idols, he began to teach people who fitting to serve only, one, only, only the God of the world. To him alone is fitting to bow down, sacrifice, so people of future generations would recognize him. It is fitting to destroy all the images, lest the people err concerning them, like those people who thought that there were no other gods besides those images. When he overcame them through his strength and arguments, the king desired to kill him. He was saved through a miracle and left for Haran. There he began to call in a loud voice to all people inform them that there is one God in the entire world. It is proper to serve him. He would go out and call the people, gather them in city after city, country after country, until he became king of the land of Canaan, proclaiming God's existence the entire time. As it states, and he called there the name of the Lord, the eternal God. Right? People asked questions, he would explain, until ultimately thousands and myriads have gathered around him. These are the men of Ab the house of Abraham. He planted in their hearts this great fundamental principle, taught it to his son Isaac, who taught it to his son Jacob, period. So what did he have to do with Shem and Eber? Did he not know that? Interesting. So Leah is asking you a question. So there were others who had recognized and knew God, right? So when we speak about Avram as the, well, the founder of monotheism doesn't make sense because certainly originally there was a monotheistic belief, right? But we'd say probably perhaps the resuscitator and the teacher of monotheism. Others had their, they were Noah-like in their approach. They had their little conclave and they weren't looking to, to teach others. Now, we all know the famous Medrash, right? It's, it's, a, it's cute, but it's actually a lot more than just cute. It's, it's the Medrash all the children know that Avram, um, his father, Terach, had, you know, he was, he was idols are us. That was his store that he ran over there. And, and one time he left Avram minding the store. He comes back and there's one idol with a stick in his hand and a nice gift in front, and all the other idols are broken. And he said to Avram, Labriot, what you do? What happened over here? He said, oh, it's terrible. Someone came and brought this gift to the largest idol, and all heck broke loose. Because all other idols wanted it also. But this idol took the stick and defended himself, and that's why he's left standing, he's the lone man left standing, all the idols are broken. And his father said to him, that's ridiculous, they can't talk, they can't move, they can't hit, they're not jealous, they can't do anything. And he said to his father, listen to what you yourself are saying. So if they can't do any of that, so why are they being worshipped? Right? Great, great uh, medrash, right? The kids love it, right? It's fantastic. But, but there's a lot more to that medrash than we think. It was, the world was a polytheistic society, right? That was the world. That there's this God and that God and this God and that God and this God and that God. And what Avram was saying is, if that's the truth, then this is what the world would look like. All shattered, all broken, all these forces 
working against one another and the strongest, right, survival of the fittest, the strongest one will win and that's what you're going to have. This world would look like this shattered place. It's only if there is this one God that is controlling everything that goes on only then can this world function as it does. Now, I'm not sure about this. We'll, we'll, I'll ask the question, we'll put it aside, maybe we'll get an answer as we work along. I'm not sure. Another famous medrash is that Avram saw a palace burning and he said, well, there's got to be, there's a palace there's got to be a Baal Habira. There's got to be a, a master of this palace. And understood there had to be a God. Right? Which, which on a simple level is, is you know, the classic uh, design theory. Right? That the more we see the incredible design of this world on a macro scale and on the micro scale, the more we see, the more we learn about, the more science opens up the wonders of this world of ours and how everything has to be calibrated to the point that it's calibrated. And if gravity would be off by one to the, you know, ten to the whatever power, one in, 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 in trillions upon trillions upon trillions, life cannot exist as we know it. And it's the more we learn about the world, how fast are we traveling right now as we're sitting here comfortably? I pick up my water, it stays nice and level, I take a sip. How fast are we traveling right now? 64,000 miles a second. The, uh, could be. Something like that. I, I don't know the exact number, but I'll, I'll go with Dove on that. Okay. Right now, we're tra- now, when you're in a plane, you know, when you're going a mere, a mere you know, 600 miles an hour, they say you really should have your seatbelt on. Right? You know, even, even if it's not lit up, you really should have your seatbelt on because you, you are traveling 600 miles an hour. Let, let's keep that in mind. Right? And as we're sitting here, right, and, you know, just calmly taking sips and, you know, we're traveling 64,000 miles a second. Anyone feeling dizzy? <laughs> Anyone feeling a little, a little nauseous? I, I get nauseous just thinking about that, but I'm, but I'm feeling perfectly fine. I mean, what's going on right now on a macro oh. scale and on a micro scale is just absolutely mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. So that's what Avram saw. I don't know if he saw the 64,000 miles a second, but that's what he saw. He saw the world. And we're seeing more and more and more and, and further and deeper and more intricately seeing this world, and it is absolutely mind-boggling. And he said, there's got to be. This, this can't be by chance. Chance doesn't create this, this incredible, incredible symmetry. That's not what chance creates. Chance creates what the dining room table looks like by Thursday night. That's what, that, that's what chance creates. Not, not everything perfectly working together. But the question that I have, I'm not sure about, we'll, maybe we'll come back to it later, is why did he say that he saw the palace burning? Why does the measure say, let's say he saw a palace what, what was the burning palace? I'm not sure. Was the palace illuminating? Illumination from the palace? Or, Interesting. Or burning as a destruction? And, uh, I, I think the term that's used is, 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 is burning <coughs> as destruction. Could right? the palace um, I think represent the earth <coughs> and what people are doing to the earth without the unity of, of Hashem? Okay, that could be, but why is that important? <coughs> Meaning, what, what, what moved him was the earth. Not that that people are 
acting in a spiritually destructive manner. Right? It could represent that, but I don't know what that what, what that adds to the mushal. But I, I, guess, the, I guess maybe um, the fact that there was some kind of a force that built this palace can also destroy it and make it like nothing. Okay. So there is, okay. you know, something yeah. that is... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Right? I hear that. I hear that. Yeah. You know, it, what I was thinking, perhaps again, I'm not sure. Perhaps is this idea again of, of the of the idols that things burn here, but but it's not wiped out. There's mm-hmm. always this balance going on between all that's going on here. That you know, you have fire and you have the water, and there's always this. This, this continuity, this balance. The question that I do want to focus on is, so great, thank you, Rambam. Thank you, Medrash. But the question that I think is still a glaring question is the omission. So why, again, we read the Psukim, and we hear about Avram being born and marrying a woman. Very nice. This is, both he and his brother married the daughters of their late brother. Mm-hmm. Right? Both him and Nachor married the daughters of Haran who had died. Okay, so we do see, right, I think David Foreman has a whole piece on this. Right? So we do see that he was looking to you know, bring continuity to the soul, right? You know, marrying the progeny of those who have died is giving them continuity. But his brother did the same thing, right? Yet Avram becomes Avram and Nachor. Uh, we don't know what happens to him. So why is all of this such crucial information? Why is all of this left out. So the Gemara says that the tractate of Odazara, of idolatry, of Avram, had 400 chapters. Our tractate in the Talmud of Odazara has, I think, four or five or six, I don't know exactly how many chapters. Right? Avram was debating. Why don't we have these debates written down? What a source of strength, what a source of help this could have been for us. Right? It's, it's such important information. Right? Either because of the information that it contains or because it will let us know how we got to the point of go forth from your land and you become a great nation. I'll bless you. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those. Let us know how we get to this point. Why is that all left out? Yeah, Debbie and then Leah. Maybe because Avram, uh, the statement is here, go and take your family and go. And he went. And therefore, right away, you get the sense that he left Haran, he left Haran, he left, he was willing to really go out into the wilderness. He went, he did what he had to do. And by doing that, he demonstrated all the things that, that you've just explained to us. Okay, so, okay. That was his godness, that was his greatness. That he, I mean, think about it. All of a sudden, somebody says to us, okay, Pick yourself up, go to South uh, America, go to the Antarctica. I'm telling you to go, go. I'm not so sure how fast we would go. I'm not so sure how fast we would listen. And because of that, because he listened, because he recognized the power of the Rabbi Nishalem, in that sense, because he did that, that is the proof of why. That's what's so important. It was unquestioned. It was unquestioned. He didn't question it. He didn't question it. But how about a, a, a good? But why is everything that preceded it not important? So, I don't know, maybe with what you're saying, we see now who he is, but maybe it's just to show us, it doesn't really matter where he came from, that anybody could have feasibly gotten there. He was, he did the same thing as his brother did, married, you know, uh, a sister. But maybe, you know, it's, it doesn't really matter where he came from, that we all have that potential, and then... And then we see from there that he was just willing to, willing to do it. Yeah. go into it. Okay, good. So we're, we're going to combine those two in a minute, Leah, and then Dove's waiting, and then Janet. I think in, um, in context of that 
um, the house burning, the palace burning, and also of the idols. I think he was searching for what is the most powerful. So, okay, all the idols, this idol, particular idol, is the most powerful? No, it can't be. Somebody's got to be more powerful. And the stars, well, they leave at night. So there's got to be something even more powerful than that. And so even with the fire burning, well, you'd think fire is the most powerful, but then water can put that out. So maybe water is the most powerful. But so, so he had to come up with something had to be more powerful than all of the above. And then it had to be God. And then when, when God showed himself to him and said, go, I mean, then he's got to listen. <coughs> you know, he's now discovered, okay, you're the most powerful. So you tell me to do this? Okay, fine, I'm going to do it. Nice, nice, nice. You can, you're combining, the, you're combining okay. the two. Nice. Dove? He married the right woman in her shrimp was <laughs> Yeah, you got the wrong side, like you don't, you have no idea. That's a good one. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure where we see that he met. Well, okay. Okay. Janet. <laughs> Those always the charmer. Always the charmer. To this point of just going, as, as Debbie has said and several other people have elaborated, um, later we see that with the Torah where um, Ishmael and Esau. The, the seer and are offered the Torah and they say what's in it and Bnei Israel just says okay you know what yeah nice so, so nice that, that that even though it's later it shows that that may be uh, as De Debbie says sort of the point of determination yeah nice yes um, not a comment but a question because I'm the relationship person um, so up to this point it feels to me that this is all cognition in his head. He's trying to figure out his world. And then all of a sudden there's this voice, which we read it in Torah, so we're kind of used to it, and God said to fill in the blank, right? But this may be the first time, because it's all been supposition up to this point. He's trying to make sense of his world. Yeah, our understanding is this, this, is, this is the first, the first so that's a, so, revelation. So there is no relationship up to this point. This is all about... I'm, I'm really believing that there has to be something bigger, and, and there's no introduction by Hashem, mm -hmm. right? There's like, yes, you're absolutely right. You know, you go to the head of the line, and now we have a relationship, this is what I, he, like, there's, there's this voice. And I'm kind of amazed, because we're used to it in Torah, but if I think of it in my real life, if I start hearing voices, <laughs> I'm gonna be a little concerned because I have no context for it. So I'm just, a little stuck in that piece because I find it amazing and I'm, I'm wondering if we're taught anything about the formation of that relationship, if at all, before this point. So the only thing that we're taught about is, as the Rambam wrote, and, and famously also there's the Ur Kazdim, where Nimrod, he debated Nimrod, and he was victorious. Nimrod was not too happy about that. And that was right? all before he had any... Any, any right. That was all... Amazing. Yeah. That was all on his own, right? That was interesting. I'll, I'll deal with that. I'll, I'll, I'll point to that in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Right? And then he was going to be thrown into a furnace and he wouldn't bow down. He refused to bow down, right? And then, right, he was thrown in the furnace and he emerged alive. Haran was literally sitting on the fence. His brother, what should I do? When he saw Avram, when he saw Avram went out, so he said, "Oh, that's what he did," and he was burned in the fire, according to the Medrash, right? And that was all before, as Laura pointed out, that was all before he had ever heard anything from God, right? Right? And yet, that's only the first of the of the ten trials of Avram, according to some. Those who count it, that's counted as the first of Avram's great, great hurdles, trials, and and self actualization steps. Okay, now, that was, and our understanding is that we're building up from the easiest to the hardest. How could the easiest be when God hasn't ever appeared right. to him and spoken to him, right? But the idea is, it's easier to do what you 100% buy into as being correct, even if you haven't been spoken to by God, then it is to do what, what goes against your very grain, even though, which are the Akedah, even though you have been told by God. 
But I like the point that you're making that what makes this so important is the, the relationship. This is when the relationship began in terms of, of, of listening. So I really want to bring together Debbie, Natalie's, and Laura's point and flesh it out a little bit more and want to work through the parsha and see it in, in glaring detail. But there's just another explanation that I heard. I'm not sure where I saw this or I heard this, but it's a very, very interesting thought. The Mishnah in Avot says that every day there is a heavenly voice, a batkal, Yotzei Mehar Chorev, a heavenly voice emanates from Mount Chorev that says, Oy Elbona Shel Torah, woe to the humiliation, to the disgrace, to the degradation of the Torah. How many of you have heard that voice? Well, none of us have actually heard the voice. Some of us have heard the voice and want to do whatever we can do to elevate that degradation of Torah. But none of us have heard the voice. So I forgot where I saw this or heard this, that this God's word was out there. Avram was the one who heard. Right? Avram is the one who heard. You know, I mean, I just, I mean, the Chavaz Chaim says that the technology gives us an ability to understand so much about Torah. He was talking about in his time, imagine our time, right? Right now, in this room, there are about 30 AM stations that are playing, about another 40 FM stations that are playing, and there are thousands of satellite radio stations that are playing right now here in this room. I can prove it to you. I take out a radio, I turn it on, and it's picking up. What's it picking up? Right? It's not attached to anything. It's not even plugged into the wall. Well, we don't hear it. We don't hear it. But it's picking up right around us are thousands of symphonies that are playing. But uh, we don't hear it. Avram tuned in to the frequency. I think it has to be inside. Yeah. That's the point. That's yeah. That's the point that's right. being laid. Avram, have to hear the physical voice. Yeah, Avram t- tuned in to the frequency. But let's go back to the points that the three of you made. Natalie, I like Natalie's point about the past. Right? If I'm going to hear about Avram's philosophical debates and points that he made, and I start reading philosophy, and I got no clue what's going on, I think to myself, oh, I guess this is just not for me. Some people are through... You know, the the, the tefillin that the men need to wear and women have the intuitive connection without, right? So we take the Shema, we put it on our heads, that's our intellect. We put it next to our hearts, that's our emotion. We strap it to our arm, that's our actions. And that there needs to be this connection to God in an intellectual sense, in an emotional sense, in a passionate sense, and in an active, proactive um, doing sense. Now, some people are touched by the intellect. Others are touched by the emotion. Everyone has all components, but it's 90-10 in some. It's 50-50 by others. There, there's so many different things. Some people love the learning. Some people love the davening. Some people love the chesed. Some people love the philosophy. Some people... Uh, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So if the Torah had told us Avraham's path, then it would seem Zuhaderech. That's the path. 
And if you if you're not a guy who can learn this philosophy or do this, then maybe it's not for you. Then you feel a little bit excluded. I'm not I'm not part of this. And, and clearly, the, the the verses are letting you know. Right, the omission is glaring. There, there must have been a tremendous amount. Thank you, Rambam. Thank you, Medrash, for filling in the gaps. There must have been an, an incredible amount that led up to this. There had to be. But exactly what was his path? That's his path. Find your path. See what speaks to you. See what moves you. Right? In the Shimon Esri, we say, no extra words, right? Why not Elokei Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? The God of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Why the God of Avram, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Yaakov? So I believe the Gra explains, or one of the Farshi HaSidur explained, that had it said the God of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, I'd say, oh, he's the God of Avram, and Yitzchak, copied, modeled, right? And his father, as did Yaakov, the God of Avram, the God of Yitzchak, the God of Yaakov is that each, he was, the, he was each one's God, right? He was the God of each one in a very unique way. And it's got to be a very unique way because every person is unique. Every person has, everyone, there's no person who is completely like another person. Identical twins, genetic copies, they, are, they, 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 they become worlds apart. Different experiences, everything about them. Right? That's the fingerprint. Right? I was, you know, everything in the spiritual world has its manifestation in the physical world. Right? That every single person is unique and is meant to say, for me, the world was created. Fingerprint. That, to me, that's what I always think of. Right? Why does Hashem make it that every single person, this, this is with the FBI in mind, why did he make it that every single person has, has their unique fingerprint? To let you know, no one is like anyone else. And each one of us needs to take our experiences and the way our mind works and the way our heart works and, and to forge that path and to build that relationship. And you've got to be who you are in forming this intimate, real relationship with God. And therefore, all that happened beforehand, that's his story. That's his journey. That's, that's not going to be your journey. And don't think it needs to be your journey. Now, let's, let's go over to what we do know about Avraham. God said to Avraham, go. And it's going to be great. Right? I mean, this is God telling you, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you, make your name great. You should be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, curse who curse you. All the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. So Avram went, as Hashem had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Right? So what do we expect? Where is he going to land? In Hawaii. <laughs> right? That's where he's going to end up. Yeah. Right? God told him, go, and it's going to be incredible. Yeah. Right? So he's going to land in Shangri-La. Mm -hmm. That's where he's going on now. This, right? And it's all going to be just hunky-dory. It, it, God told him to go, and it's going to be great. And what happens? Right, page 56. They went to go to the land of Canaan. They came to the land of Canaan. Right, Avram came to the land. The Canaanites were then in the land. God said to Avram, I'm going to give to your children this land. He built an altar, right? And he traveled a little bit, pitched a halah, her tent, right? His, his wife's tent first, right? So traveling southward. And then verse 10, what do we have? Vayihi ra'av ba'aretz. 
right? There's a famine in the land, right? Talk about your old fixer-upper, right? <laughs> this is where you sent me, right? You told me to come here. This is, you know, this is going to be Shangri-La over here. And there's a, there's a famine in the land. And Avram went, Mitzrayim, what did he have to do? He had to leave. He went to Mitzrayim, La Gursham, to live there, Kikaveda Rav Baaretz. The famine was great in the land. God, you told me to leave my place, to go to this place, it's, and it's going to be, right, you, you promised me all these things, and you're sending me into a famine. Vayikasher hikriv lavo Mitzrayimah. So what do we hear about Avraham? God spoke to him. He followed. Was it easy to follow? It wasn't easy to follow. Okay? He goes, uproots, goes to a place, and it's lousy. This is not what he signed up for. What does he do? Now, according to a Rashi learns, this was one of the challenges of Avram. According to Ramban, Ramban has a different approach on it. But we're going to go with Rashi now. This is one of the challenges of Avram, right? That he passed. What was the challenge? Rashi says there was a, fa- there was a famine in that land alone. To, to, to challenge him, is he going to start to second guess the words of God? That God told him to go to the land of Canaan, and now he's telling him to leave there. Now he's forcing him to leave there. And Avram said, okay, I'm going to carry on. I'm not going to get disillusioned. I'm not going to say this was an ill-fated venture. Why did I ever start off? God continues, which I think leads into what Laura was saying, that it's a relationship that's being built now. And there's trust in this relationship, as Janet said, right? Whereas, whereas the children of Israel said, Nasev and Nishma, right? We will, he, we'll do it. Now tell me what, right? In a relationship, right? You know, someone asks you, you know, can you do something? You know, can you help me? You know, can you do something for me? So the understanding is, I love this person. This person is, is not going to ask you to do something that I can't do. The answer is yes. Mm-hmm. What can I do for you? If the answer is, well, what is it that you want, right? Then already that there's, not, that there's something lacking mm-hmm. in that relationship. I'll get phone calls from people. Very interesting phone calls from people. <laughs> I got this guy called me <coughs> right, to let me know. Rabbi C. I probably mispronounced it because I, I know the problem. Rabbi, yes, this is so and so. Hi, how can I help you? Uh, this is very important. What I want to share with you. I, I already could figure out what's coming. Yes, All right. Well, I want to let you know that the Messiah is here, and he's ready to go to Jerusalem and to proclaim himself and be accepted by everyone. So I said to the guy, I said, that's great news. Uh, we've been praying for him to come, you know, for generations, right? As soon as he, you know, gets to Jerusalem and is, and is you know, vetted by the authorities there and, and, and proves to be, in fact, the Messiah, you know, Bob, Bob, you and I will do a dance together. I'm going to seek you out and we'll dance together. I said, well, there's one thing, Rabbi. Okay. What's that? Well, he could only go if everyone, to proclaim himself, if everyone has accepted him. So I said, well, Bob, you realize it's a bit of a problem that we can't necessarily, it's kind of catch-22, right? We can't accept him if we don't know who he is. Well, I've got all the proofs, and I really believe. I said, well, I'm glad you do, but um, he'll really need to be accepted by everyone. He said, well, you know, can I come talk with you? I said, well, do you have a website? You know, so he said, yeah. I said, well, maybe I'll take a look over there and where, where, where all the proofs are. Right? 
You know, so people call, you know, it's not, yes, anything you have to say. But when it's a spouse, when it's a brother, when it's a sister, when it's a parent, when it's God, so then we understand. Yeah, can you do this to me? Sure. <clears throat> what is it that you like me to do? So Avram is building this relationship. What is it that we need to know about Avram? Not how he got there, like Natalie said. Not how he got there. He got there, That he took that road. Great. I took this road. He took that road. She took that road. Now, we have a class uh, with... Um, with about close to like 10 people Monday nights in our house of people who are in, in the process of converting, right? Either sometimes both of them, sometimes it's, it's one of a couple, you know, and, and it's amazing. It's amazing, right? At, the, at our table, we've got different colors of skin. We've got different nationalities. We've got, you know, different background, right? How everyone got there is, is, just, is just astounding. The first time we met, I asked everyone to tell a little about themselves. And it was just fascinating. It's amazing. How does everyone get there? As many people as there are in the world, that's how many paths there are in the world. But what's crucially important? The relationship with God that's being built. And the faith in God that is being demonstrated, right? The castle might be burning, but it never burns. There are things that go on, but it's never, it's never, it's never burnt. There are always things that are going on. And, and, and we work through the Parsha, right? The whole episode with Sarai and, and Paro, right? And then they go traveling. And the next episode we have is on page 58, 59. Right? Also Lot, by right, verse 5 there, went with Abram, had flocks and cattle and tents. And the land could not support them dwelling together. Right? There was quarreling between the herdsmen of Abram. Right, right? This is the blessing. This is the blessing. The nephew that I took along. Right? Now there's a whole, a whole faribal, a whole machloka going on between, between our herdsmen over here. Right? Separate from me. So Lot went towards Sodom, right? And then, okay, God speaks to Avram again, right? And he said, right, raise your eyes, right? The repetition of the promise, right? You know, it's not like, don't lose faith, right? That first, everything that's happened since I last spoke to you and you followed has gone, actually, he went south, right? And the expression, right? It's gone south. Right? Nevertheless, keep on going. Raise now your eyes. Look out. North, south, east, west. I'll give it to you, to your descendants forever. You often will be as the dust of the earth, right? They cannot be counted. Walk the land, length and breadth. I'll give it to you. Right? He built an altar. What's the next thing that happens? There's a war. There's a crazy war going on over here. <clears throat> Four kings, right, against the five kings, right? There's a whole battle going on. Actually, the, the, the some of the Farshim speak about four against five. <coughs> right? How many Goliaths do we have? Right? There are four exiles. There are four main exiles. This is four against five. The Maral speaks about four represents the four directions. That's, that's the physical world. What is five? That's Dalit. What is five? Four with a nekuda, with a dot in the middle. That there's a source. That it's not just this aimless shooting out in different directions. There is that center point. There is that which everything revolves around. So the battle of the four against the five 
is the battle of the, the powers of denial of God against this idea of there being this God. And the four, the four win. And then the five, right, rebel. And there's a battle again of the four against the five, right? Our history is going to be four, right, four, five, four, five. That's what's going to be going on. And then what happens? Then what happens? Lot. Lot is taken captive. What does Avram need to do? He needs to go out to battle. He needs to go out to battle against these four powerful kings. Again, this is, this is what we need to know about Avraham. Not how he got there, but how he lives his life, how he keeps going with this emuna. You want to know why he is our father? Why he is Avram Avinu? Not how he got there, but how he lives, what he does, how he perseveres and he keeps going right stone the king of stone wants to give him gifts right I will not take anything of yours you should not say you made Avram rich right etc etc right then we have this page 66 page 67 we have the Brit Bain Habitarim we have the covenant about the future what will be, and a frightful future, right? And here is where we have the, on page uh, 69, verse 13, and he said to Avram, know with certainty, right? Your children will be foreigners in a land that's not them. They'll be enslaved. They'll be oppressed for 400 years, right? And then afterwards they will come out for Rechush Gadol, right? So, all that Avram went through, we say, Masa Avot Siman Labanim. Right? He went through all of these stages, and that's going to be repeated again on a national, on a nat- on a national scale. Right? There was a famine, and Avram needed to go to Egypt. Does that sound familiar at all? Right? B'nai Yisrael. There was a famine. What happened? We went down to Egypt, right? And what does Paro do when he, when he goes down to Egypt? He takes Sarai, right? We were taken over there. And then what did it say? I didn't read it before, but Hashem, right? Take a look at page 58, 59 for, for a moment. Hashem afflicted Paro along with his household with severe plagues. Hmm. That sounds somewhat familiar, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Right? And then, right? Why is he done? Right? Take her. Now take your wife and go. Right? And they escorted him and his wife and all that was his. Right? So we see that what went through over here with Avram and Sarai, that is what happened with B'nai Yisrael. So once Avram has shown his mettle, that he is going to maintain this relationship with all that's going on, now he has reached the point where he is, not just you, right? you, have, you have charted the destiny of, the, of your children and of the world. And that's going to be this galut and then geula. That's what happened in Abraham's life. Galut, exile, and then Geula, he was able to leave Egypt. The children of Israel had Galut, and then Geula, and the world goes through Galut, exile, and then Geula. That is the Olam Hazeh, the Olam Haba, that is this period of time, and that is the Yemot HaMashiach. And then it continues, 70, 71, with all of these promises about children, about nationhood, about the future, one problem. 
No children. No kids. And Sarai is unable to have children. Now, uh, the Gemara asks, why is it that the matriarchs, I mentioned this before, why is it that the matriarchs, besides Leah, were, were all barren? Right? You, you would think if you're applying for the job of matriarch, the first thing you need to click off on the list is fertile. fertile <laughs> right? If you can't have children, then your chances of being the matriarch are nil to none. Yet three of the four matriarchs started off as barren. The Gemara asks why. The Gemara answers, interestingly, because the Kodesh Baruch Hu's mit'aveh le'tfilatam shel tzaddikim. God loves the tfilot of the righteous. Meaning, relationship. Relationship. God wants a relationship. In order to be a matriarch, there is a prerequisite that comes before fertility. What is that? An intense relationship with God. And therefore, if the way to build that in, in, intense relationship is to start off without the number two on the list in order to get there, so be it. So be it. So the matriarchs all start off in front of here, Sarah, having no children. So again, what is going on with this promise? We keep having promises, reiterations of the promise, and that which is in front of our eyes is contradicting that in every way, shape, and form. So Sarai says, oh, it must be that the way that this promise will be fulfilled is not through me, but through my maidservant marrying Avram and having children. And she does that, and it goes bad, right? She was lowered in her esteem, right? This outrage against me, it keeps going bad, bad, bad. An angel, right? On and on, right? But we end off with the Brit, the covenant that takes place, right? And it's going to continue on. The saga will continue in Parshat Vayera, right? What is it that we need to know about Avram? And this is, this is a point that I've made a number of times. I, I, I think Dennis Prager, uh, in, in, in one of his debates, see, he said, uh, and he said, you know, the religious God-believing, God-fearing person needs to explain why is there pain in the world. The non-God-believing person needs to explain why is there a world? Why are we here? What are the chances of our being here. As we heard, as Dove says, 64,000 miles a second, right? How are we staying on? I mean, it's, it's, it's just astounding. But I, 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 but I would like to disagree with him. And I don't think that the God-believing person needs to explain why there are problems in the world. Because the God-believing person, our God-believing state is based on the God book. What is the God book? The Bible, the Torah. And right from the get-go, the Torah lets you know. Right? Adam, Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava in God, and, and are, in, are in the Garden of Eden. Doesn't last a day. Doesn't last a day. They're sent out to toil. Cain and Hevel, right? Hevel gets murdered. What did Hevel do wrong? Why? Tur doesn't deal with that. Tur doesn't deal with that. Hevel is where he is going afterwards. That's not, that's not our concern. The concern is, can we rehabilitate Cain or not? A flood. Right? Dora Flaga. And then we have, then we have Avram. Oh, now it's going to be all, now it's going to be smooth sailing. You think so? Just continue reading. Just continue reading. Right? This world, I, oh, I've said this many times, asking why there are difficulties, challenges in the world is based on a misunderstanding of what the world is meant to be. It's like asking why are there weights in a weight room 
Why are there obstacles in an obstacle course? It would be a lot easier if I didn't have to lift the weights. I could run the course a lot faster if there weren't obstacles. But the point of a weight room is to build yourself up. The point of an obstacle course is to show you the abilities that you have in overcoming obstacles that you would not know you have and would not bring them into actuality if you didn't go through and run that course. And life is meant to be a course of self-actualization. For the God-believing person, life is a course of self-actualization. And in order to self-actualize, one needs to have resistance. In a physical sense, if there's no pain, no gain, no resistance, there's no buildup. And in a spiritual sense, if there are not challenges, if there are not obstacles, hardships, some pain along the way, then we stay muted as this, as this, as this undeveloped human being. We don't ask for tzarot, we don't seek it out, we, we wish everyone a good, sweet year. We pray for a good, sweet year for everyone. We wish a person a mazal tov. Mazal doesn't mean luck. Mazal means that which will flow to you should be good, an easy environment. That's what we hope for. That's what we pray for. But we know that there is, you know, I, I don't like the term, you know, only, you should have only smachot. Right? To me, that, that's, that's Lala. That's Lala. Right? That's not life. Don't, don't wish someone something that, that um, is, 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 Lala, is Lala land. Right? Mm -hmm. Only have smachot. Right? I would say we should share many smachot. Right? We should be there for one another. Right? At all times. That's, that's the brachot. That, that's the reality. So we don't, you only need to explain why there are issues in the, pain in the world if we don't understand what the world is. But a God-believing person who sees this as a world of self-actualization leading to the next stage understands that from the, from the get-go, the God book and the God nation in this parsha, the God nation is built on adversity and things not going as we would have scripted it, but you keep on going, you keep on going, you keep on going. That's what we need to know about Avraham, not how he started out, not what his path was to get there, but once he got there, how does he live that life and how does he persevere and keep on going? Okay, my friends, we'll call over here. Yes, Jen. So getting back to Sarai and Paro, why doesn't the why doesn't he have faith that, that right from the get-go Hashem will protect and, and there would never be an issue that, that Avram would be, we, would be killed, even though Sarai is very pretty? So, according to Rashi, right, he left, he was right in leave, right, the, the challenge was not to stay in, in Canaan and not eat and see if he'll die. I get that, but in going So, in the same sense, right, you've got to work with the situation that you have and make your best call. Now Ramban says that he made a mistake. It was a challenge that he failed. He should have stayed, he shouldn't have gone. And it's also a mistake that he made in this whole Sarai sister debacle. Ramban says that that was a mistake, right? Which I think is, is fantastic. It's fantastic to hear that Avram made mistakes because rumor has it that some of you here at some point in your life might have made a mistake. <laughs> That's what I've heard. I don't believe it, but I've actually heard that. Right? So it's good to hear that Avram made mistakes and he is Avram. That's what, that's what help, allows me to get up in the morning and, um, and face each day. You can make mistakes and be Avram. So past and future, right? It's, it's not you're given a pass, but... That is that is what is expected. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Yes.
I'm sorry. That he what? I'm, so, I'm sorry. He built an altar. Oh, built an altar. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. 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 It was a stone altar that he built a sacrifice, yes. But right now our altar is a table. Never, not even the sitter. Correct. Our table is in the place, as we mentioned last night, our table is in the place of the altar, that's correct. Yes. Yes. Table, which is that which you said on Shabbat. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's, it's, it's been a lot of classes since then. I'm sorry. It was so amazing about Shabbat. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Those eight points from that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah